Hey everybody, it's Mike from Electric City Sentai Denzi Caster, and this week on the Denzi Blitz as part of ECS Network's Halloween week, we're taking a look at Frankenstein. Well folks, that's right, we're taking a break from your regularly scheduled Denzi Blitz. We're taking a break from Power Rangers Dino Supercharge this week, don't worry. We'll pick up right where we left off next week, just seven days away. But this is Halloween week here on the ECS Network, and all the ECS Network shows are doing Halloween-themed episodes. So yesterday, you saw uh, us playing Elder Sign on uh, Rage Quit Radio. Today, we're taking a look at Frankenstein, starring... Boris Karloff and Colin Clive, the classic Universal Monster flick. So, before we get too far into this, I'm going to now uh, make an admission of guilt and potentially lose my geek card in the process, or at least have some points docked on it. This is only the second Universal Monster movie I've ever seen. Um, the first Universal Monster movie I've ever I had ever seen was actually last week when I watched uh, Dracula for the very first time, and not even the Bela Lugosi version. We were, watch we were watching the Carlos Velarius version of Dracula, which, for the record, you'll get to see the discussion about that uh, about that movie in a couple of days on Denzycaster when I sit down with uh, Andrew and we talk about it. Uh, so literally, my first two Universal Monster movies, Dracula and now Frankenstein, starring Boris Karloff. Um, I really don't know why it's taken me so long to get around to these, other than the fact that, generally speaking, I don't like the horror genre. Uh, be perfectly honest, I like to sleep at night, and so um, horror movies have this nasty tendency of making my mind race in weird directions that keep me from being able to nod off, and if I do, I wind up waking up with nightmares. So, that's just me. I don't do well with, with scary stuff, right? But uh, the Universal Monsters were uh, less what we would think, think of today as horror. Well, what we think of, and if you hear me pronounce horror as horror on occasion, uh, that don't worry, that's my southern accent coming through. Um, my father beat that into me at a young age. Um, but the, the horror genre as a whole, I've never been a huge huge fan of. Um, I think that comes part and parcel with the fact that most modern horror movies tend to be slasher flicks and gore fests, and that I've never been a fan of. But this, this is something that's actually always fascinated me, the old Universal Monsters. Uh, there were books at our school library when I was in high school that I used to check out on a regular basis about the Universal Monsters. Um, and the legacy that they had. Uh, most of them, or I shouldn't say most, but a lot of them had literary uh, counterparts and literary origins. Dracula was originally a novel written by Bram Stoker. Uh, this was originally a novel written by Mary Shelley. Um, the concept of these versions of movie monsters, uh, especially over the last several years, uh, you can... This, they're, they don't need me to give them a cheap plug, but uh, you can thank, in some ways, Cinemassacre's Monster Madness video series for uh, piquing my interest in these. Um, but a, a lot of it stems from um, now, in my modern mindset, I'm 37 years old, or 36 years old, I'll be 37 next year. It's the first time I've ever seen these things, right? Um, it's... Probably a lot thanks to tokusatsu, because in many ways, even though this is what we would call toku adjacent, which is something we don't normally do on Denzi Caster and Denzi Blitz, um, tokusatsu has a lot to owe to the Universal Monsters. Um, we think of, really, King Kong being the inspiration for uh, the earliest days of tokusatsu, especially Godzilla was heavily influenced by King Kong. But the Universal Monsters probably have more of a precursor to Toku Heroes 
than one might think. Uh, after all, Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman, uh, among others, have been the inspiration for numerous toku baddies over the years in Kamen Rider, Super Sentai, and beyond. So it only makes sense uh, that we go back and, and sometimes take a look at and pay homage to uh, to these guys here. And, and I'm going to say I was very much intrigued as I was watching this film by a lot of things. Now, this right here, <clears throat> this is, the, of course, the Blu-ray release, uh, which uh, I picked up at a local Walmart for only 10 bucks, which is a heck of a deal. Um, the movie, uh, which came out, and I'm consulting the back of the box because... To be perfectly honest, I do not have any of this committed to memory. 1931 is when this film first debuted. So this movie right here is now, oh, 86 years old as we are talking here today. Um, starred Boris Karloff, Colin Clive, May Clark. Uh, May Clark played uh, Elizabeth, who eventually becomes uh, the uh, wife of Henry Frankenstein. Now it's Probably worth noting that they changed some names, if you're familiar with the literary version. Um, and then, of course, uh, Colin Clive plays Henry Frankenstein, who was Victor Frankenstein in the uh, original uh, novel. And then, or Vic, I don't remember if it's Victor Frankenstein or Victor Von Frankenstein. I think it's just Victor Frankenstein. And then Boris Karloff plays the monster. Uh, a lot of people, because of this image or a version thereof, have over the years taken to calling this guy Frankenstein. Well, this isn't Frankenstein. This is the monster, or as Boris Karloff preferred to call him, the creature. Frankenstein's the doctor that makes him. Um, and so you have Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. Um, in this film, just some some observations, and to give you a general plot synopsis, if you don't know the story of Frankenstein, because uh, we do give those here on this show, uh, Frankenstein is essentially, and we're going to isolate it to this version, uh, the story of a mad scientist, uh, a brilliant, uh, probably biologist and medical doctor, but best as I could tell from watching, but a brilliant physician who uh, winds up with a god complex. He thinks he can reanimate uh, dead flesh. He thinks that he can bring the dead back to life. He thinks he can create life by stitching parts of people back together, which is essentially what the monster is. It is choice body parts from different uh, cadavers and different uh, dead bodies and such. Uh, in fact, the very first scene is the, him and his assistant, Fritz, digging up a grave. Uh, and they eventually do get a brain to put in the beast. Um, but he, he is so all-consumed by this that he has forsaken everything, including his impending nuptials. Um, however, once the creature is brought to life and he realizes that uh, the creature is going to be uh, well, damn near uncontrollable, uh, the decision is made that the creature must be put down. His mentor uh, convinces him that this must be done, and um, he must, you know, go back to your normal life. You have a, a lady waiting on you. Do that. And uh, the monster going wild and killing uh, his assistant Fritz, who frankly is a jerk and torments the monster uh, very early on in the film, uh, the, uh, uh, after the death of his assistant, Frankenstein basically realizes that this was a horrible mistake and goes back to marry the love of his life, Elizabeth. Um, the monster essentially is seeking revenge, uh, one assumes, and, uh, tracks down Frankenstein... Uh, well, I should say Frankenstein tracks down the monster. The monster's on the lamb. Uh, eventually there is a confrontation between an angry mob armed with torches uh, surrounding a, a windmill that the monster is holed up in. Uh, Frankenstein himself goes in to confront the monster. Um, <clears throat> and, it, it, well, it doesn't bode well from there. I shouldn't say Frankenstein goes in to confront the monster. Frankenstein confronts the monster on a on a, a 
hilltop, mountainside, what have you. But then final confrontation takes place in the windmill, which actually doesn't end well for Frankenstein either. He gets thrown off the windmill, hits the windmill, fan blades themselves, and then falls to the ground. By all accounts, he really should be dead, but isn't. Uh, and the movie ends with Frankenstein recovering uh, at his family home, Elizabeth, uh, loyally by his bedside, and we assume that uh, they will be wed and there will be be a son to the house of Frankenstein, according to the Baron at the end of the movie, uh, Henry's dad. So, the the plot of the movie is pretty simple. Um, it's a version of uh, Frankenstein or a modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley, uh, which was actually a narrative that she came up with uh, on a basically a bet. Uh, it was a, a writing contest that Lord Byron um, came up with during a, a retreat one time way back when. Um, Mary Shelley and her husband and Lord Byron, who could write the scariest story? Um, she won, I think. So in the novelization, uh, the monster is capable of speech, and it actually becomes a sort of a trail of bloody vengeance that the monster is going to have its revenge upon Frankenstein. Here we don't really get that, uh, mainly because they didn't adapt the entire novel. Uh, many elements of the Mary Shelley novel wind up in the sequel to this, called The Bride of Frankenstein, which probably further went to confuse people as to whether this dude here is Frankenstein or not. Um, what I liked about this version, number one, uh, I enjoyed the acting. Here's one thing you, you have to always, I think, keep in mind. Whenever you watch something um, that's a movie or film or television show, and I've, I've said this numerous times, you've probably heard me say it, uh, you have to, when you are thinking about evaluating, critiquing something, you have to take into account the era in which it was made. Uh, this was made in 1931. Uh, so we have had 87 years of technological advances that make this movie, by comparison, visually and uh, uh, auditorially, sound-wise, very bad. Um, with that said, good acting is good acting, and pretty much always has been. Uh, there, there's no real technological advances in that regard. Uh, Colin Clive is terrific as Henry Frankenstein. Um, I don't know why they changed the name, maybe to make it a little more accessible, uh, make it sound a little more American, but he does a really good job as Henry Frankenstein, and, uh, the tonal shifts are a little, I shouldn't say tonal shifts, the shifts in attitude are a little, like, quick, uh, but then again, you do get a sense that time is passing in the movie, so, um, uh, I don't necessarily fault them for that, but I mean, he does go from stark raving lunatic to, oh my god, what have I done, to, uh, you know, stalwart fiancé protecting his wife uh, to be in very short order. In fact, the, the film is only an hour and 11 minutes. It's 71 minutes long. That's short even by today's standards. So, um, so it's, you have that. Um, but like I said, Colin Clive does a tremendous job as Henry Frankenstein. Um, Boris Karloff, this is the movie that made him a star. Uh, he had done several films before this, both silent films and, back when this was made, the newfangled talkies. Um, but this is the one that made him a household name. Uh, and it made him a brand in certain ways. I mean, it got to a point where the last name alone told you who this guy was. Um, they started marking, marketing things not as Boris Karloff in, but simply as Karloff. That's all you needed, just the first name. Um, or pardon me, the last name. So he really, uh, in this, does so much with really so little. Um, the monster has no lines. This version of the modern Prometheus does not speak. Um, so Karloff has no material in that regard to go off of. But the body language, the facials, um, the 
just the the physical acting is really really good um the costuming in this movie is actually quite nice uh again that's one of those things good costuming is good costuming um, the only time it really gets dicey is if you start looking at, say, sci-fi stuff, uh, because 1930s, 40s, and 50s sci-fi costuming is going to look a lot different than now. Um, the makeup on the, the creature itself is tremendous. Um, I, I will say that. Part of it goes to Karloff himself. Uh, he thought in the initial makeup test that the creature looked a little too intelligent. Um, so he came up with the idea of the wax you see here, the the brow that the creature has, that is actually mortician's wax, uh, a little morbid, um, that's uh, there above the eyes and actually on the eyelids themselves to help kind of weight things down and, and give him the not-quite-all-there look. Um, but he does such a tremendous job, and the makeups makeup effects were so well done because he was able to act through them. A lot of times when you have heavy prosthetics like we would use today in films, uh, it's hard to get the facials to come through them. But the really, really best makeup jobs, you can get an otherworldly or creepy appearance and still be able to see the acting through it. Uh, another really good example to me is the, the makeup from the old Planet of the Apes movies. Uh, the original Charlton Heston Planet of the Apes that there were some heavy prosthetics for the time in the 1960s, but you could see Roddy McDowell and company acting through it. Same sort of thing here. And Karloff does a really good job making the creature almost a sympathetic character, um, especially early in the film. Uh, Fritz tortures this thing. Um, basically attacking it and holding it at bay with a whip and a torch, and the creature is deathly afraid of fire, uh, which comes into play, obviously, at the end of the movie. But there's a, a lot of things there to justify why the creature is doing what it's doing. Um, it kills Fritz. Uh, it, you could call it a justifiable homicide, realistically, because the creature has been threatened uh, very, very mortally threatened by Fritz. Um, the doctor, Frankenstein's mentor, uh, winds up, um, Frankenstein's mentor, who, by the way, plays, uh, plays von Helsing in Dracula, came out before this. Um, Universal Studios used a lot of the same dudes. This is back in the studio system when you would see a lot of the same actors appear in a lot of movies back to back to back to back to back, all from the same studio. They were under contract to the studio themselves. Um, but you had... Um, he kills the doctor because the doctor's the one that subdued him with a needle. So from the monster's standpoint, uh, this old man stabbed me and made me feel really weird and I you know, passed out, uh, if the creature even would comprehend that concept. Um, because we know the creature is not overly intelligent, the creature is more instinctual. Um, so again, it's sort of a self-defense mechanism. And then, uh, later on, we see the creature has a level of innocence to him, uh, when he encounters a little girl playing by a lake, and they're playing with flowers and making the flowers float on the lake. And when he runs out of flowers, he wants to keep playing, and he thinks, well, the little girl is is beautiful like a flower. Let's make her float, and throws her into the lake, and she drowns. Um, and it's a, a case of the creature is lethal when he is defending himself. He is lethal... Uh, in his innocence, uh, he and perhaps that's the moment that the monster sees itself as a monster. Um, it is maybe a little bit of the sense you get out of it because then he goes after Frankenstein's wife uh, or wife to be. Um, eventually, the child is brought to town. Uh, a manhunt begins in the old-fashioned torch and pitchfork variety, and um, you know I, I, I got to say just. Karloff comes off in the movie just brilliantly all the way through because you get that range out of him. Again, some of it is turn on a dime, much like Colin Clive, but 
again, you're, you're covering a lot of ground and you can get the sense time is passing it quickly in the course of an hour. Sound design wise, the sound effects are quite good in this movie. There's little to no score. This is again the 1930s and in this era of films, talking pictures were very, very new. Um, and silent films tended to have a musical score to them, kind of to distract you from the fact that you're not hearing anything from the movie itself. So you have here uh, a film where every sound is justified, but they do have some really good music playing that sets a tone and, and you get a feel for. There's some dramatic score towards the end of the film, um, but uh, usually any sound effect is justified by the surroundings. They do a really good job, though, and I, I appreciate the sound design in here. Um, visually, the movie looks really good, even 87 years later, to my eyes. Um, High-definition Blu-ray does the movie no favors whatsoever. In certain regards, you can tell that certain backdrops are really just curtains that have been painted. Um, but if you put yourself in the lo-fi, low-definition days of the 1930s or earlier, or uh, you know, slightly later this would have looked really, really good, and it still does. Um, some of those stages had to have been massive for what they were shooting, uh, and uh, the rock faces and the crevices and the, the valleys and the, the ravines, you get a sense of scale and feel, and it does look really, really nice. There's really not a thing about the movie that I can complain about, except that maybe the ending comes really, really quick. Um, the... I should say the epilogue. The ending in the tower, uh, you really do get a sense of the creature being in fear, that the creature is, you know, the, the visceral action kind of thing. Uh, it's not what you would think of today in a modern movie with the big action-packed third act. Um, but there is some action. There is a confrontation. Uh, and it is an enjoyable finale to the movie. It's just the, the final scene being the Baron kicking back a... A glass of wine that his son is not going to need because he's on the bed healing. That just seemed a little odd to me. But all things considered, everything said, this is a really good movie. And I would highly suggest it if you're one of those people who can set time frame aside, that can watch something that's got some age to it and appreciate it for what it, you know, for the time it was made in. This is a really cool movie, and I would heavily, heavily, heavily recommend it. Uh, I intend to pick up some more of the Universal Monster stuff down the road. Uh, like I said, I've got Dracula, and I've got Frankenstein, and I guess I should probably watch the Bela Lugosi version of Dracula at some point in time. Um, maybe next year. Maybe next year for Halloween week here on the network. But, uh, yeah, folks, this has been fun to sit back and watch. So... Uh, if you haven't seen this one, go check it out. There were a lot that came after it. Uh, there have been several different takes on Frankenstein over the years, but uh, this one, really, really cool. So, folks, I hope you've uh, enjoyed this Halloween edition of the Denzi Blitz with uh, me and old Flat Top over here. Uh, of course, we will go back to our regularly scheduled shows next week here on the network, which for Denzi Blitz means we go back to Power Rangers Dino Supercharge next week here on the Blitz. If you want to help us out here on the network, uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Just leave your comment down below. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you liked the video. If you didn't like the video, give it a thumbs down. Any kind of constructive uh, feedback, we greatly appreciate. Uh, hit the subscribe button. That helps us out too. And of course, uh, you can become one of our patrons over at patreon.com slash ECS network. Uh, or you can pick up a cool t-shirt like the one I'm wearing right now over at our Cafe Press store, cafepress.com slash ECS network. All the funds we get there go to help us get equipment for the channel. Uh, none of us get paid for this, folks. We do it because we love it. We all have jobs outside of this. So uh, every dime that you donate or you put in is helping us get new equipment, new gear, and stuff that we can make more content for you guys out there. So folks, hope you've enjoyed. Tomorrow here on the network is going to be a special episode of Kana and Mike's Movie Night, making a Halloween return. It's going to be me and the wife as uh, sitting down to check out the musical Phantom of the Opera. Uh, not the old silent film Lon Chaney one. No, no, no. We're going to be watching one of the musicals. 
because my wife really likes musicals, and she actually does dig The Phantom of the Opera, another thing I haven't seen. So we'll take a look and see what we think about that. Uh, coming up Thursday on Denzy Caster, it's me and Andrew checking out the uh, 1931 Dracula starring uh, Carlos Velarias. It's the universal uh, Spanish version of Dracula. And then uh, this Saturday on 8 Star Anime, they're checking out Beautiful Bones. Not Beautiful Bones. What are they checking out this Saturday? You know, or Friday? I really don't know. They checked out Beautiful Bones last week. Maybe there's some more Helsing Ultimate in our future. That'd be pretty cool. Who knows what they got coming up on 8 Star Anime, but it'll be awesome and it'll be Halloween-y, so check it out. Until next time, folks, thanks for joining us. I'm Mike from Electric City Sentai Denzi Caster, and we'll see you next time.